it's a hierarchy. It has a definite order. Hierarchy means a definite order from the highest to the lowest. And if you put it this way, see. So therefore, the particular names of the gods are really filling these blanks. In other words, these blanks in here are really the order. See, there's an order. You have to see that there's an order. If you see that there's an order, then you can see that certain gods fit in it. So you can talk about the order of the gods or the order of the order of the gods. See, they're different. And you've got to keep that in mind when you read this stuff or you get confused. Right? Simultaneously, he'll use those two languages when he needs to. Now look. If there is this order, what's the significance of the order within which you can stick all of these different gods? Well, what's really astonishing is that there is, there is a structure that can be found where this order is clearly established. subject of the first hypothesis. But it's expressed negatively. So if you want to look at that order positively, the same ideas proceeding in the same way are found positively, this is negatively expressed, in the second hypothesis. So the Plato's first and second hypothesis is outlining nothing other than the, the order, the order that reveals a ordered structure hierarchically presented that will allow anyone else when they see that to say, oh, I can now see why I can put in the different gods where they belong. Freaking amazing. Freaking amazing. <laughs> because he does this whole thing, and it looks like it's just a logical exercise. That's right. So, uh, I was going to Xerox a bunch of papers. And I got caught up in something tonight and didn't get a chance to go down and get it Xeroxed. But I have this, a lot of this on a piece of paper, and I'll make sure I Xerox it and get it available for next week. Now, um, this entire order, look here, this entire order of the which we're familiar with, sometimes called the Olympian gods. Um, and that's a good name for Olympian gods. Now, why do they play such a major role? And is it possible that you can find that 
position in positively in the second or negatively in the first hypothesis. Well, this is the problem, the word nature, so. Nature is the realm of soul and body. That's us, right? Living beings. That's it. Equals wherever you can find, therefore, these elements. That's the realm of nature. Anything alive gives evidence of having a psyche, right? A breath of life with a body. Now. You can also talk about, do you not agree, that the soul can depart from the body, and you can talk just about soul. <coughs> and the soul and its higher plane can also involve intellect. These are the three levels of the souls. That's all. These are the three levels of the soul. Why? Because the process of getting that the soul, the process that the soul takes in freeing itself of the body so that it can therefore experience the nature of reality can be represented by each one of the gods in the Olympic hierarchy. That's all. Caution. Many of the gods say Zeus. Zeus plays a major role here, plays a major role here, plays a major role here. And the same thing is true for other gods, that they can play in more than one realm. So when you go through this, you just have to make sure which level you're talking about so you can see that it fits. If not, you get them all mixed up and it's going to be chaos. Now, uh, I'm just going to read you just one sentence out of the Parmenides. Now, this should be so straight, brief, episodic. It should be clear, very simple, simplistic, and should be able to express the very nature, I, bad, bad word, the very essence of the thing it's defining. So, uh, now, by the way, this whole thing is said to have been developed, that is to say, the person who made it clear and made the identification is Cyrenius, who's Proclus' teacher. This idea was present, but it appears to be that no one worked it out until Serenius, who was Proclus' teacher. Okay, so. Uh, I used to have a very clean copy, <laughs> and then Nancy started reading it and marked it all up. 
<laughs> so don't let your wife or girlfriend get your book. Right? Should be easier to read now with all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? How do they ever give women the right to read? <laughs> okay. Here it comes. Now I'm reading in the first hypothesis 140C. Since then, it is, it is of such a nature, it can be neither equal nor unequal to itself or other. Why not? Of its equal, it is of the same measures as that to which it is equal. Yeah. And if it's greater or less than things with which it is commensurate, it will have more measures or less measures according to its being commensurate and less and less measures than the things which are greater than it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And in the case of things which uh, it is not commensurate, it will have smaller measures than some and greater than others, of course. It talks like this for about uh, six more lines. And therefore, you can see that this clearly identifies the gods and the no. mundane or and cosmic, doesn't it, Brad? Uh, it does? How? <laughs> okay, now look. That's all. I mean, that's it. I could have read it the other six lines, but it's of the same nature, nothing new. So... Um, In Proclus's commentary on Plato's Parmenides, right? this is the sheet I was going to Xerox for you, but somehow I got misled. He says, you know what? This is being discussed on 1201 in the, Parmenides, in the commentary on the Parmenides. So, much to my surprise, I can turn to 1201, and uh, I thought I'd show you how he resolves this problem. I know you're at the edge of your seats right now, and waiting for a solution to this. Oh, that's where I left that note. <laughs> it's a good note. <laughs> he says, what is said in the about the uncosmic gods, either one. The being gods. They're all symbols that you have to decipher. So, here it is. Remember what he started with? Equal, unequal. Measure. And then went through this discussion, commensurate, what's not commensurate, did equal parts and equal numbers and when are not commensurate, unequal parts, etc. Okay. I mean the equal and the unequal. That is reasonable, 
right? That it is reasonable that this commensurate and incommensurate should appear at this very point. For among incorporeal and immaterial entities, such as antitheses, they can have no place, since everything there is rationally related and has its basis in pure forms. But here we are. But where there is also a material substratum, substratum and a mixture of form and formless, a mixture of form and formless, But where there is also a material substratum and a mixture of form and formless element, then it's reasonable that there should also be an antithesis of commensurability and incommensurability between things, which the encosmic God maintained directly, that is, souls and bodies. <laughs> well, is there any common measure between a body and a soul? No. They're incommensurate. They're incommensurate. Hmm. Nature is incommensurate. But incommensurate means we can now apply the idea of equal and unequal. For something to be commensurate means there must have equal measures. And if it's incommensurate, it must have unequal. unequal. Therefore, he's now going to go into discussion, and that's all it's going to be about, is that as you talk about these two, you're going to need two words, commensurate and incommensurable. What does that presuppose? Equal and unequal. Serenius then looks at this and he says, Oh! Plato's Parmenides, that section I just read, equal and unequal, that whole section, that's obvious. It fits into... And that fits into, and that's the way he builds his case. Where? He's going to take one sentence out of the Parmenides that I read. He explores it, yes, in one paragraph, but that's all. And then, Proclus in this commentary, he says, I'll show you how it fits, and that's the way he describes it. And he says, you can only find commensurate and incommensurability on this level of soul and body. That's in the realm of nature. Nature is in the realm of the mundane gods. Mundane gods are the same as the end cosmic gods. The cosmic and cosmic or mundane gods are the Olympian gods. Therefore, you'll find every point, every point, in the 14, hey, in the 14 ideas, uh -oh. And why there are 14 becomes a question instead of 12, but let me leave that out for a moment, okay? There are 14 ideas that are related to collapse, so you end up with exactly the same number of ideas as they are God. Olympian gods that are in the realm of the mundane world or nature, and therefore if you want to see how they can talk about the relationship of the soul and the body in such a way that you can get out of one to get a pure state of the soul, you understand the Olympian gods. Outstanding. I'm, I'm curious about the word you, the word you use, uh, commensurate and uh, incommensurate. Uh, Which word? And consummate? The commensurate and incommensurate. <laughs> Pardon? Commensurate and incommensurate. Oh, go ahead, tell them. Oh, that's what he was saying. <laughs> Please add, just add means, more. Uh, because Remember, it presupposes two sets of words, equal and unequal. Okay. Can you use those two words in respect to commensurate and incommensurate? Uh, well, I could. Well, I mean, my question, I guess, is that it seems like as soon as one is, as soon as one is, as soon as you have being and it's no longer one, then there's an incommensurate something incommensurate or uh, yeah there's something incommensurate between the two and such that there's such that there's already been an equal and unequal established prior to having prior to the, the incommensurability you were talking about between soul and body it seems like it's already been established 
Could you accept the notion that if something is commensurate, it must have equal measures? If it's commensurate, equal measure. Okay, that's not sure. Okay. Therefore, if we we're going to talk about commensurate and incommensurate, that's just a fancy way of talking about something that is equal measures and something that does not have equal measures. Okay. Therefore, they both are needed to talk about and presuppose talking about equal and unequal. Watch now. Next up. In the, in the, in the, we'll call it, in the metaphysical world, where do you find most clearly commensurate and incommensurate? He's saying you don't find incommensurate when you're talking about pure soul or the intellect. You only find it in the realm of between soul and body because they are incommensurate with one another. Therefore, that's the realm of nature. That's in here, that's in here, that's in here, that's the game. <coughs> so then the, is one implication that soul and intellect are simply different in terms of uh, magnitude? Yes. And also, there'll be some gods that will remain the same, others will not. See, because uh, the realm of pure soul, uh, the, mirror, the mirror image or analogical significance of the gods on the level of soul is this. So you have to see that the reason why there are a number of them that are in both is because they're carrying out similar functions, especially in the relationship to soul. I didn't really want to take this much time on it, um, but I was asked about it. Now, so in, but can I ask one more question? In that respect, um, it's not really a question of greater or less, but of model and copy. I'm just yes. reading back what I heard. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's right. Copy, model. Copy, model. All the way up. <clears throat> so just to clarify my understanding, to say that soul and body are incommensurate or not commensurate, that's really saying that there's no likeness between the two. Is no that, common measure between them. But, but the, implicit in that is to say that there is also no likeness. Okay. okay. Let's see, there are three. See, when you're talking in this way, you're talking about same and other, right? and then you're talking about uh, uh, like and unlike, and then you're talking about equal and unequal. So the point you're raising talks, presupposes that we can talk about these ideas going back to same and other. And this is really the first hypothesis of Plato's primary. But please now ask your question again. In mathematics, Raphael, yeah, right? That's what I was going to ah, bring up. Yeah. Never uh, well, Barbara can say it. The, I mean, I think what kind of what Barbara was saying as far as there being a different magnitude, a simple, a, a simple demonstration of it is in mathematics where it's like, um, you know, if you, if you keep along the same magnitude, it doesn't really matter, you know, if you have one or if you have two, or you know, or four, they they all have they can be they can be commensurate with each other because they're all made up of ones. They it's have the same unit measure. Yeah. Yes. It's only if you go outside of it. If we were to do, you know, this, that now becomes no matter how much we want to chop this up and half and half and half, we're never going to get this incommensurable magnitude there. In that. So in that case, you have incommensurability, but it took a, a higher magnitude or a higher geometry to generate it. Well, uh, but to say so that we can, yeah. to, to say that means that. If, if there is no common measure between the two, how many measures? There, but it's it's not necessarily saying that there's they're incommensurate in an absolute sense, because 
Having a measure is another way of saying that there is a likeness. That's the key. Say it again. Having a common measure is another way of saying that there is a likeness. Which means we have not budged Raphael the Immovable from his original position. He will not go for analogical likeness or in reasoning with this geometrical model. We must leave it to the grinds unless we come up with another strategy. Okay. <laughs> I agree with Barbara. Hello. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I got a little bit off. I should have finished it, but uh, I took the same dialogue I passed around your way, and I added a bunch of pages to it that put this into perspective. So... Uh, I'm going to drop this, but I'm, it's nearly finished, but I have to put a couple of more words on top of it. Hopefully good words. So let me pull this off, and let me suggest something. Okay. Uh, how do the Greeks, how, do, how does Plato, how do they use mythology? I mean, this is looking at the metaphysics of mythology. This is seeing how we plays with it. This is how these people played with metaphysics, mythology, order, hierarchy, all of these ideas for a thousand years. That's what we're seeing, the top level of this reflection. Um, why don't we get, hold up this, we'll go back to it, and let's get into something like Plato's Phaedo that was suggested. And let me ask you two questions. What is the role of heroes and what is the role of God? One kind of God, there are actually more than one. Right. Apollo. And two others, Cadmus and Harmonia. Right. But right now, all right, let's see it. Then we can answer, why, there, why is there Apollo? in the Phaedo. Does he, does he exhibit a certain grouping? Um, then we can see what he's doing in the Phaedo because in the Phaedo he's going to show That's where you're going. It's going to show how different gods can be shown to represent the philosophical ideas and which gods do not. That's the goal of the Phaedo. All right, and what else is he going to do? Also, Heroes. Now, oh, <laughs> why don't we just take our time and read two pages of the photo? Is that fair? So we can see this. Yes. Yeah. All, right. All right. Then what do we promise to do? Go back to this Alcibiades. I'll finish this little dialogue I'm doing. That will put all of this stuff in terms of. Uh, why they have the order they have and things like that. But especially, let me add one thing before we do it. Zeus, Zeus is said to be the god primarily for the philosophical life. That is to say, the way in which the soul can separate itself from the body is through philosophy. The highest term is Zeus. And for Proclus, he's said to be the philosophic god. He is the philosopher. All of the others are going to be stages of philosophy. 
And I should finish that for you for the next week. Hold on, give me two weeks because we have a rabbit that gets in trouble and I have to get her out of it, you know, the sandbox. Is that fair? Okay, good. So why don't we jump into the fate of one condition now. You have to ask one question when we get into it. Why, why the question? Why the questions in the beginning? Now, this is central to the whole thing. And therefore, we'll get it quickly when we get a couple of readers just to go through the photo. Fair enough? And many of you don't have books, but you don't need it since we have enough just to get a couple of readers. And Barbara looked up at the right time. Sure, I'd like to read. And we need another reader. <coughs> I'll read it. Thanks. Go ahead. Marty, you're up. I read enough. Okay. <clears throat> Want to come up? Come on up. <whistles> okay. Thank you. Can no I commercials during this reading. <laughs> Can I take Phaedon and let you have Echocratus? I've always wanted to be Echocratus. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> from, we're taking it from the top. I yes, I think we are. Were you there yourself, Phaedon, with Socrates on the day when he took the poison in prison? Or did you hear about it from someone? I'm I sure. was... <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. What do you say? That was a question, right? No, I'll do it again. He's asking for an eye, eyewitness, right? Go, well, if he is, go ahead. You Were you there it. yourself, Adon, with Socrates on the day he took the poison in prison, or did you hear about, it, or did you hear about it from someone? This person. What does he want to know? Were you there? there. In person. Were you there? Did you see it? Right. Were you there? Go ahead. I was there myself, like a fattest. Then, what was it our friend said before his death? And how did he end? I should be glad to hear it. You see, no one at all from our part of the world goes, goes now to visit in, in Athens, and no visitor has come up to us from there this long time who might be able to tell us properly what happened. All they could say was, he took the poison and died. No one could tell us anything about the other details. Okay. They're looking for details. details. Right. And he's very interested in what Socrates said and how he ended. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Then you never heard how things went at the trial. Yes, somebody did bring news of that and we were surprised how long it had seemed between the sentence and his death. Why was that, Phaedon? It was just a piece of luck, Echocratus. For the day before the trial, it so happened that the wreath was put on the poop of the ship with the, the Athenians sent to Delos. What ship is that? That is the ship, the Athenians say, in which Theseus once went off to Crete with those twice seven, you know, and saved them and saved himself. The Athenians vowed to Apollo then, so it is said, that if the lives of these were saved, they would send a sacred mission every year to Delos. And they do send it still, every year, ever since that, to honor the god. As soon as the mission has, become, has begun then, it is their law to keep the city pure during that time, and to put no one to death before the ship arrives at Delos and comes back again here. This often takes some time when the winds happen to delay them. 
The beginning of the mission is when the priest of Apollo lays the wreath on the poop of the ship. And this happened, as I say, the day before the trial. Accordingly, Socrates had a long time in prison between the trial and his death. Then what about the death itself, Phaedon? What was said or done, and which of his friends were there with him? Or did the magistrates forbid their presence, and did he die alone with no friends there? Oh, no. Friends were with him. Quite a number of them. <clears throat> That's just what I want to hear. That's just what I want to know. Please be kind as to tell me about, to tell me all about, tell me all about it as clearly as possible, unless you happen to be busy. Oh, I have plenty of time, and I will try to tell you the whole story. Indeed, to remember Socrates and what he said himself and what was said to him is always the most precious thing in the world to me. Well, Phaedon. Okay. Hold it on. It's just what I want to know. as clearly as possible. Um. And the last statement, of course, He's word perfect. Okay, that's all. Okay, that's good. He's word okay. perfect. Thank you. What do you make of this? I believe that was a hand up. I'm gonna wait. Good. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, it would seem to be a set By the way, Ecrates was said to be a well-known Pythagorean. Does that matter? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Why does that matter? I don't know. Because <laughs> that's why I asked, does it matter? He said yes. Yeah. Because he sets the standards. And their Pythagorean standards, this business of recalling most exactly, right? We couldn't get anyone to say anything clearly to us, to speak most clearly as possible. Um, that's at least the first thing that comes to mind in terms of answering the question. Um, okay. Let me try something. Though. As we read further, what if Phaedo had given the account of the death of Socrates without any of these points, is it possible that he could have given the story? What's the significance of what was added? This was, if he drew this, if this is what, see, just what I want to hear. Look at these three questions. What does he want? Three statements. What does he want to know about? What they said. Death itself, what was said and what was done, and friends. Four. Two, here. What was said? How did he end? What did he add? Is there a progression here? Hmm. In a sense, is this how Socrates is setting the stage just as he, you know, sets a scene in others about when Socrates is coming down from Athens to the gymnasium? 
it's setting the scene for what's going to happen for us. He's, he's, it's a uh, outline of what we're going to hear. That's true. And a very That's thorough one. one. And I'm interested in knowing, could not this story that we're going to be reading be told without any of these pieces of information that's being asked for specifically. So let's get our team up and read a couple more lines. <laughs> How about we just read a couple more lines from where we are? If it's only a couple more lines. Well, I would. It's not up to me. Yanni would, would find that objectionable. <laughs> Let me see you if that's true. You could lip sync it when we were... No, I doubt it. Twice moved. From I must say, Pierre? I must say I had the strangest feeling being there. I felt no pity, as one might, being present at the death of a dear friend. For the man seemed happy to me, Echocratus, in bearing and in speech. How fearlessly and nobly he met his end. I could not help thinking that divine providence was with him, at, was with that man as he passed from this world to the next. And on coming there also, it would be well with him, if ever, with anyone that ever was. For this reason, I felt no pity at all, as one might at a scene of mourning. And yet, not the pleasure we used to have in our philosophic discussions. The conversation was certainly of that sort, but I really had an extraordinary feeling, a strange mixture of pleasure and pain at once, when I remembered that then and there that man was to make his end. And all of us who were present were very much in the same state, sometimes laughing, sometimes shedding tears, and one of us particularly, Apollodorus. No doubt you know the man and his ways. <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Well, he behaved quite as usual, and I was broken down myself, and so were others. But who were they, Phaedon? Of our countrymen, there was this Apollodorus I have mentioned, and Critabulus and his father... And besides, Hermogenes and Epigenes and Iskenes and Antisthenes. There was also Stasippus, Stasippus, the Paean, and Menixenos, and others of our countrymen. But Plato was ill, I think. Were any foreigners present? Yes, Simeus the Theban, and Cebes, and Phidondes, and from Megara, Euclides, and Terpsion. Oh, we're not then Aristippus and... Cleombrotus present? No, they were said to be in Aegina. Was anyone else there? I think these were about all who were present. Very well. Tell me, what did they talk about? That's it. Okay. How many people? Fourteen. Fourteen? Mm -hmm. uh, named. Named? Has to be named. More, come on. Nice. On the ship. Fourteen. How many were there? Seven. Fourteen? Fourteen. How are they divided? Seven guys, seven girls. Fifteen, really. Two groups of seven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. Are there two groups of seven? Mm -hmm. Yes. Make sure. Would you agree we can now create an analogy such as what if the 14, 7 plus 7, are to the 14 around Socrates? Right. 
We're generating analogies from what is being structured, are we not? What if the 14 in the ship are to the 14 around Socrates? Oh, wait a minute. If Theseus saved the 14 by going down into the labyrinth, that's slaying the Minotaur, then what must Socrates do? Finish it. Saves the 14 from death. 14 named. Along with himself. Because he says that. Along with himself. Right. But look. Um, Theseus then well, slew the Minotaur. That's a Minotaur for those of you who lack art. <laughs> Only he knew the Minotaur was slain, and he had to come back to the 14 and persuade them that, hey, I did it. Wow. If so, then, Socrates must do something, and there must be similar to something called the Minotaur. Agree? And also, in the myth, it was through the agency of Apollo. That's yes. absolutely right. The assistance of Apollo, divine help, that That's this right. was all ultimately accomplished. That's right. Hence the uh, celebration ritual and all that stuff. So there has to be some kind of analog That's right. on the side of Socrates and right. his friends. Some divine providence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where we have been spending a little time, these three are called the anagogic gods. The gods, then, that can bring man out of the, the body into the pure soul through a vision of ultimate reality. So, Plato is picking Apollo. Hermes is said in uh, the works that we're dealing with to have introduced the power of dialectic. Aphrodite, without love, you ain't going to go far. You'll just be an intellectual, in the lowest sense of the word, without the love of the truth. Right? She plays an absolute central mean between these two. For Apollo, then, can then awaken the people who have the power of love who push the idea of the wisdom being beauty itself, and Apollo is the agent then that can return the soul of man to its source, which is, of course, Zeus. And Zeus is said to be, as we mentioned before, the very origin of philosophical life. So just hold that. Let's go back here. Um, that's rather curious, then. Uh, does that mean, then, we might find a way in which to describe... Here it is. Can Socrates be called a philosophical hero? Analogous to Theseus? And if so, what is it that he has to slay? And how can these 14 rep be represented by the 14 with the thesis? And uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't remember the story as, or the reason as to why the, the 14 were sent to uh, the Minotaur in the first place. Hmm. Why they... Repeat that for me. Oh, he's asking the original crime for which the 14 were being sent these, uh, to... They're the... sacrificing. Because... Yeah, Every four years, they had to send seven and seven to satisfy 
the fact that the uh, Greeks were in debt to the Cretan kingdom or At that time, the, the Cretan Empire was magnificent, you know. And that saved the destruction of Athens. So every year they had to do it. But what's interesting, though, now is that in honor of this, this event takes place every four years. Right? So it's deep into Greek culture. So what did the, did the Cretans have, like, a pet and or something? I don't. They needed to feed them virgin? Pardon me? Uh, uh, it's just a, it's kind of it's just an odd it's just kind of an odd story. I'm just still wondering about this about the sacrifice of the fourteen. Uh, the Cretan Empire, I understand, and, and as a debt to save to save Athens, but why a Minotaur? Then? Well, why? I'm not sure I got that. He wants to know, in a way, the origin of the Minotaur. What is the Minotaur? Oh, thank you. Would you help? Well, I I. Is? I don't recall all of it at this point. I, I not precisely. Okay. I, I don't recall only half part of it. bull, ah. half man, oh. and he lives in a labyrinth. Yeah. And every four years, by the way, have you ever seen these it's pictures genius. of the Cretan, the Cretan, where the youths are somersaulting over a bull, like grasping their horns and jumping over them? Mm-hmm. They didn't last long, which is why they needed volunteers. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but is he is the he the son of the king or is the he the queen. son of a son god? Of the, son, of the son of the king. Son of the king. That's right. Son of the king that they owed the debt to. That's right. Okay. The queen. But the min- and, in terms of the origin, and, I believe. Oh, it was, thank you. I believe it was the Minotaur was born. The only thing in the in the myth that refers to the origin of the Minotaur is that it was born out of a some kind of um, sickness of the queen, and there there is that. But once it was born. Then it was Daedalus who who built the labyrinth. I know? thought I thought it was uh, oh. King Minos. And they yeah. kept the Minos. Minotaur in a labyrinth, very who, uh, difficult. No one ever could get down there and come back alive because they got lost in in the different ways it turned about. Okay, so so Theseus got it. smart Zeus and pitched woo to Adrienne, who was the daughter of the king, and she said, "I got a way to go. When you get down in the labyrinth, bring a bowl of twine with you." See. And as you go through it, tie it at the end and go through, you'll always find your way back. And being a smart girl, she let him use a sword. That was very important for him to slay the Minotaur. So she was doing pretty good. Most women today. That's why they gave him a bow later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's why a lot of women even today give men a lot of rope to hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute, that doesn't work. <laughs> so liquor. At this point, would you agree the story could be told without any of this? Therefore, it's only cosmetic and we can forget about it. No. Or? It's symbolic. It gives us a way to look at the structure of the dialogue. Then we're going to have to see how Apollo functions, Theseus functions, and how this analogy can be spelled out in detail. Here, could we make the assumption that the Minotaur represents death? I'm for it. <laughs> you think that's a, a, an honest okay. assumption? Okay. Okay. Oh, see. You meant death of the 14, that's for sure. Yeah, see. But can he slay death for the 14? Because remember in the story, the 14 do not know that the Minotaur was slain. Therefore, if Socrates is something, or does something that can be called slaying death, he would be the only one who would know it. And therefore, in that sense, we have to change the word saved, don't we? Yeah. Yep. Because in one sense, he didn't save them. Theseus did in another way he did it. Can we ask why, you know, that when you were asking about the number of here, um, the answer that was offered from us was that there were five foreigners and nine Athenians. Mm-hmm. But you have grouped them into seven and seven. I was wondering what caused you to do I mean, You're I know absolutely it fits right. the myth better, Let's but I do don't it. quite get it. Let's do it. Let's count them. Yeah. I thought it was four and ten. 
if Back you Fado. Fado, Fado, doesn't Fado have to be, because he's one of our countrymen, doesn't he have to be uh, Athenian? I he says, because he says, um, oh, I forgot about him. Fido says, a, a picture, you know. Athenian is someone who is from Sparta. Wait. Yeah, there's nine, there's nine. We're in a bonus <clears throat> present. Others of our countrymen say. So I don't know. Yeah, That's, I'm uh, sorry. I, was yeah, so I put a, I put a pin. In, in the end of Sparta. Athenians are people who live in the end of Sparta? Greeks are Greeks who live in Sparta, in a special area called Athenians. They are Spartans, not Athenians. Athenians? Paeonians. Paeonians. Is that yes. what you're talking about? Yes. Okay, that gives... I, 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 I allowed for that possibility, but then aren't I still one short? Because I have five foreigners well, and two Go ahead, count. Okay. Read it again. Apollodorus. One. Critobulus. Two. Hermogenes. Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. no, no. he's not named. He's oh, not named. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Hermogenes, Epigenes, Aeschines. So, or should we start again? Apollodorus. Two. One. Critobulus. Two. Hermogenes. Three. Epigenes. Four. Aeschines. Oh, no, and no, Tisthenes. Up to this point. Five. Is Six. Epigenes. Four. Five. And Phaedo. So that's seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's seven. Six million. There was also Tesipos, mm -hmm. the Paean and Paeanian, and Menexenos. And Menexenos is an Athenian. Is not? How do you know that? I know it from the dialogue called Menexenos. Ah, okay. You mean he's another Paean or Spartan or something? No. Hmm. But, and anyway, would you agree we can get 14, but the way I'm counting, it puts 7 and 7. Right, and that's what you want. That's what I'd like to see. I hadn't no, seen that. No. Otherwise, we'd have to look for 9 and 5. Yes. Or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, right? In other words, we do not have to agree. There can be many possibilities as long as they add up to 14. Yeah, but if we want, to, we want beautiful, I'm saying, symbolic quality. I'm saying I mean, I'd rather keep seven and seven. That was in the myth. Yeah. Now, how can we make that sense of that? I, I like the way you made sense of it. Yeah. Okay, a paragraph or two. Oh, sure. Um... Was anybody else? Was anyone else there? Was any, oh, I think those were about. These are about all who were present. Very well. Tell me, what did they talk about? I'll try to tell you the whole story from the beginning. You see, we have been accustomed during all the former days so to visit Socrates. From the beginning means that this could have been ignored. Absolutely. Right? There it is. From the right, I'll tell you from the beginning, therefore this is not necessary. <laughs> right? Had it not been for Escrates to say, hey, there are eight points I want to be covering here. Right. So he gets this data. Good. You see, we had been accustomed during all the former days to visit Socrates, myself and the rest. We used to gather early at the court where, he, where the trial had been, for that was near the prison. We always waited until the prison was open, passing the time together, for it was not opened early. And when it was opened, we went into Socrates and generally spent the day with him. That day, however, we gathered earlier than usual, for the day before, after we left the prison in the evening, we learned that the ship had come in from Delos, so we warned one another to come as early as possible to the usual place. We came early then, and the porter who used to answer the door came out to us and told us to wait and not to go in till he gave the word, for, as he said, the eleven are knocking off his fetters and informing him that he must die today. After a short while, he came back and told us to go in. So we went in and found Socrates just released and Xanthippet, you know her, with his little boy sitting beside him. Then when Xanthippe called us, saw us, she cried out in lamentation and said, as women do, O oh, Socrates, here is the last time your friends will speak to you and you to them. 
Socrates glanced at Criton and said quietly, Please let someone take her home, Criton. Then some of Criton's people led her away, crying and beating her breast. Socrates sat up on his bed and bent back his leg and rubbed it. Some of Criton's people, not Criton, he stayed. Mm -hmm. Right? See mm -hmm. how well he did that? Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead. Socrates sat up on his bed and bent back his leg and rubbed it with his hand and said, while he rubbed it, How strange a thing it seems, my friends, that, what, that which people call pleasure, and how wonderful it's, is, is its relation to pain, which they suppose to be its opposite. Both together they will not come to a man. Yet if he pursues one of the pair and catches it, he is almost compelled to catch the other two. So they seem to be both hung together from one head. I think that Aesop would have made a fable if he had noticed this. He would have said they were at war and God wanted to make peace between them and could not and accordingly hung them together by their heads to the same thing. And therefore, when you, whenever you get one, the other follows after. That's just what it seems like to me. First came the pain in my leg from the irons and here seems to come following upon it pleasure. <clears throat> you want to go on here? Well, we're having a theory of pleasure and pain. Okay. From one of the four chains. Yes. Ah. Where was it hiding? Well, it was philosophically very. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. CB's took a You want to read CB's and I'll read, continue to read Sock? What do you think? I mean, it's Beto. Or Socrates at this point, or you can take sure, Socrates. Sure. Okay. Uh, Cebes took up here and said, "Upon my word, Socrates, I am much obliged to you for reminding me about your poems. I mean, when you put into verse Aesop's fables and the prelude for Apollo, many people have asked me. For example, you know, the other day, what on earth put it in your mind to make the, those poems after you came into prison, although you never made them before?" Then if, you then if you care that I should be able to answer, you know, next time he asks me, and I sure, I'm sure he will, tell me what to say. Tell him then, Cebes, just the truth, that I did not want to rival him or his creations when I did it, for I knew it would not be easy. But I was trying to find out the meaning of certain dreams and getting it off my conscience in case they meant to command me to attempt that sort of composition. The dreams went like this. In my past life, the same dream often used to come to me, in different shapes at different times, but saying the same thing. Socrates, get to work and compose music. Formerly, I took this to mean what I was already doing. I thought the dream was urging and encouraging me, as people do in cheering on their own men when they are running a race, to compose, which, taking philosophy to be the highest form of composition, I was doing already, but now after the trial, while the festival was putting off my execution, I thought that if the dream should really command me to work at this common kind of composition, I ought not to disobey the dream, but to do so. For it seemed safer not to go away before getting it off my conscience by composing poetry and so obeying the dream. So first of all, I composed in honor of the God whose festival this was, and after the God, I considered that a poet must compose fiction if he was to be a poet, not true tales, and I was no fiction mon monger. And therefore, I took the fictions that I found in my hand and knew, namely Aesop's, and composed the first that came. Then tell you and Ostat, Cebes, and bid him farewell, and tell him to follow me as soon as he can, if he is sensible. I am going away, as it seems, today, for so the Athenians command. Um, what do you make of that section? Um, he's into dreams. Mm -hmm. right? And the last, this he's saying, you know what? Just to be safe, I'm going to take this. Literally. Literally. <laughs> but he's doing the whole thing, right? He's doing it. For what? To serve what? As what? 
Are you doing this for what purpose? What to do it? Because of... Uh, off his conscience. Of course, he had dreams. This is what he's doing. But he's composing and doing and explaining all of this. Uh, for what reason again? To play it safe. What? To be safe. That's true. Okay. Yeah. To yeah. get it off his conscience? Yeah, okay. Yeah, to find the... Get what you can take, take what you can get, right? He's trying to find the meaning of certain... What, what? He's trying to find the meaning of certain dreams. Well, that's true. Okay, let's go. To make the point that philosophy is doing the highest form of music? What? To make the point that the activity of philosophy is the highest form of music? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving this explanation to see these for you and us, isn't he? Yeah. Is there anything we've left out, folks? <laughs> <laughs> to get off clean? He's honoring Apollo. To get off clean? I don't know. I just... Do you have the book? <laughs> no wonder we're having trouble. <laughs> someone said to honor Apollo. Oh! Did you hear that? Oh, That's who the, said that? Peanut gallery, someone. It's in the peanut gallery. Mm. Good. It, it's all for what? Mm. To honor... To honor the god of this festival. What's the festival? Apollo. Right. This is all there for He's offering it up as a prayer, isn't it? Mm. In honor of the god Apollo. Mm -hmm. Ah. Hmm. Always interested in that. Okay. Let's a couple of more lines. What advice, Socrates, to give you knows? I have often met the man. From what I have seen of him, so far, he will be the last man to obey. And why? Is not Eunos a philosopher? I think so. Then, Eunos will be willing enough. And so will everyone who goes properly into the subject. But perhaps he will not do violence to himself, for they say that's not lawful. As he spoke, First he let... kind of death... Suicide. First kind of death discussed, right? Because As it's not lawful to do violence against yourself. That's say. right. That's what he says. Okay. It's a they say. It's a weak statement. I'm just going to explain that in a minute. So the first kind of death is knocked out. Not allowed. Go ahead. As he spoke, he said that he let down his le legs onto the ground and sat thus during the rest of the talk. Then therefore. That ends it. Now, the talk. Hmm. Right? Third phase, right? One, two, three. Okay, good. What do you mean, Socrates, by saying that it is not lawful for a man to do violence to himself, but that the philosopher would be willing to follow the dying? Why, Cebes, have, you, have not you and Simeus heard all about such things from Philolaus when you were his pupils? Nothing clear, Socrates. Well, truly, all I say myself is only from hearsay. However, what I happen to have heard, I don't mind telling you. Indeed, it is perhaps most proper that one who's going to depart and take up his abode in that world should think about the life over there and say what sort of life we imagine it to be. For what else could one do with the time till sunset? Say, um... 
This is Cebes and Simeus. I understand they had a teacher. Is that right? Yes. What was the teacher's name? Philolaus. And what grade did Socrates give for his teacher? They gave him a kind of an F grade. And how? What? No clarity. Right? Wait a minute. If follow the logic, right? If everybody knew, knows that Equites happens to be a Pythagorean, right? And now we're dealing with Cebes and Simeos. And their teachers will allow it. It's good. And they were never taught what Socrates is talking about. What do we know about his teacher and therefore the student right from the beginning? They missed the most central doctrine that Socrates is going to uncover. They're true foreigners to that and they're in foreign. that way. Right. They're foreigners in that yeah. way. They're yeah. foreigners to that logos. Yes. Right? Yes or no? Yes. Were you not his pupils? <laughs> uh-huh. And you didn't learn that? Oh, I know something about your teacher. How much you pay okay. Really? <laughs> yes, one more paragraph? What do you say? Well then. Yep. Well then, why, why pray do they say it is not lawful for a man to take his own life, my dear Socrates? I've already heard Philolaus myself, and you asked me just now, when he was staying in our parts, and I have heard others too, and they all said, we must not do that. But I've never heard anything clear about it. They gave no explanations. Hmm. No reasons. Go ahead. Well, go on trying. And perhaps you may hear something. <laughs> <laughs> Is that pretty good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might perhaps seem surprising to you if in this one thing of all that happens to a human being there is never any exception if it never chances to a man among the other chances of his life that sometimes for some people it is better to die than to live but it does probably seem surprising to you if those people for whom it is better to die may not rightly do this good to themselves but must wait for some other benefactor true, true for ye by Zeus Indeed, put like this, it would seem unreasonable. But possibly there is a grain of reason in it. At least the tale whispered in secret about these things is that we men are in a sort of custody and a man must not release himself or run away, which appears a great mystery to me and not easy to see through. But I do think, Cebes, it is right to say that the gods are those who take care of us and that we men are one of the gods' possessions. Don't you think so? Yes, I do. Now, the anagogic gods are to take care of us, right? That's where, how they function. He's making a note, right? Some people would say, oh, yeah. Go ahead. <clears throat> then, if one of your own possessions, your slave, should kill himself without your indicating to him that you wanted him to die, you would be angry with him. And punish him if there were any punishment? Certainly. Possibly then it is not unreasonable in that sense that a man must not kill himself before God sends on him some necessity like that which is present here now. Yes, indeed, that seems likely. But you said just now, Socrates, that philosophers ought cheerily to be willing to die. That does seem unreasonable, at least if there is a reason at least if there is reason in what we have just said, that God is he who cares for us and we are his possessions, that the wisest men should not object to depart out of his service in which we are overseen by the best overseer there are, God's. There is no reason in that. For I don't suppose a wise man thinks he will care better for himself when he is free. But a foolish man might well believe that he should run away from an owner and he, would not, and he would not remember that from a good one he ought not to run away, but to stay as long as he could. And so he would, he would thoughtlessly run away, while the man of sense would desire always to be with one better than himself. Indeed, in this case, Socrates, the opposite of what you said would be likely. It is proper 
that wise men should object to die, and foolish men should be glad. Okay. One last paragraph. Cebes is always on the hunt for arguments and won't believe straight off what everyone says. Okay. Okay. For next week. Okay. And I hope to finish that little dialogue I was doing. If I don't have trouble with my rabbit. So we did announce in the in the. Okay. Yes. yes we did announce. It. Well, first of all, I guess the dates are set. They're going to be. Uh, June 24th, 25th, 26th, the, ones, the second set of dates. And I also let you know I'm going to send an, out an email that it may be that the places at the seminar are limited. So if you want to go, because we, we don't have the larger place unless something changes. It could change. But right now we'd be limited to a maximum of 27 people, and that'd be pushing it. So, um, so we have the Dingle May House rather than the... Um, mm -hmm. Friendship. Friendship Hall. Friendship Hall. So the prices will be the same as they were before, which I think is 250 Is it 250 for us and 275 for people who are not members? Something like that. I'll, anyway, I'll get out the details. If you're not on our mailing list, let me know. Thank you. Yeah. And then you'll get really cool memos about how we're reading the Fido, you know? <laughs>